Please be seated and good morning. Most of you are aware that I am a revert to Catholicism. Not a convert, but a revert. I was born and raised in a devout Catholic family. I attended nine years, including kindergarten, of Catholic grade school. I was an altar boy. I then spent eight years in the seminary studying for the priesthood. You may have heard me say somewhere along the line that the Reader's Digest version of my story is that in the confusion of the 1960s, I left the seminary, and in the chaos of the 1970s, I left the church. I left the church not because I disagreed with any of her teachings, but because I became disillusioned over the experience in the 70s of seeing so many individuals preach and teach in the name of the church things that were blatantly and seriously contrary to what the church believed, professed, and taught, and do so with impunity. That experience caused me to conclude, mistakenly, I might add, that the church had lost her way. I know today what I didn't know then, that the church cannot lose her way. That's impossible. And by the way, that problem of people saying things contrary to what the church teaches in the name of the church has by no means gone away. There's no shortage even of priests and bishops, sadly, today, propagating heterodoxy on a regular basis, especially in the realm of morality, and getting away with it. At any rate, I then sojourned for 30 years in conservative Protestant churches even being ordained as an Anglican priest in founding this parish, Christ the King, in 1996. But all the while, all that time, feeling the strong pull to come home to the Catholic Church. Eventually, Pope Benedict XVI gave me and others like me the awesome, humbling privilege of being ordained a Catholic priest. And not only that, of being able to bring this parish with me into the church. If you haven't heard that whole story and would like to, you can go to YouTube and find Father Ed Meeks on the journey home for the video of the interview with, that I did with Marcus Grodi of EWTN a few years ago. So why am I telling you all this today? I'm telling you this in the context of today's epistle reading from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, as a backdrop for some reflections on the importance of sound doctrine, doctrine rooted and grounded in the truth of God as revealed in the sacred scriptures and in the authoritative teaching tradition of the church. First and second Timothy are pastoral letters from St. Paul to his young disciple, St. Timothy. Paul had ordained Timothy and left him in leadership over the newly formed church as, at Ephesus as its bishop. As Paul was writing these letters, the Ephesian church's very existence was being threatened, not by the Roman Empire, not by physical assault, not by widespread sinfulness or bitter quarreling among the faithful there, but by false doctrine false doctrine that was coming from within. And so St. Paul instructed Timothy to protect the church and the faithful and to preserve the Christian faith by teaching sound doctrine and modeling right living. Timothy, uh, Timothy had, assert, had to assertively oppose false teachers who were leading church members away from the faith of the apostles and of the word of God. And without going into great detail about the nature of the false doctrines, suffice it to say that Paul felt so strongly about the importance of sound doctrine or sound teaching as the remedy of what was going on in the church at Ephesus that in his two short letters to Timothy, he makes reference to it 13 times. Which brings us to an important question. 
Namely, why is doctrine such an important consideration for us today? As reasonably well-educated Catholics in a modern society with all of the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments and 2,000 years of church history and teaching behind us, why is it important? Why is it necessary? Well, one reason is that human beings have a frequent tendency to gravitate more to fables than to the truth. How else do we explain, for example, the incredible popularity of supermarket tabloids or the meteoric rise of bizarre cults? How else do we explain our popular culture's propensity to raise up of all people, Hollywood celebrities, as experts on everything from abortion to global warming to world hunger? How else do we explain the apostasy that has led so many churches and so many people away from the truth, accompanied by the specter of many Christian denominations at their periodic general conventions debating and voting on what they are currently going to believe. How do we explain all that? But as Catholics, we hold to the principle that there is such a thing as absolute, unchanging, infallible truth, and that truth is constant in our faith. And so our jobs as Catholics is not to decide what the faith is in each generation, our job is to pass the faith on intact to the next generation. That faith has been revealed to us by God in the sacred scriptures and in sacred tradition, the sacred tradition of the church. So let's talk about the scriptures for a moment because that's what St. Paul is talking about in this epistle reading today. The Bible is not a collection of fables, myths, and legends or of people's opinions about God. It is not just another humanly authored book. The various human authors were inspired by God to write what they wrote. Of course they wrote from the, their own personal, historical, and cultural contexts, and of course they used their own minds, talents, languages, and styles. But they wrote what the Holy Spirit inspired them to write. The Bible is then a compilation of writings penned by human beings, but ultimately authored by God himself. In Christian thought, one of our classic foundational truths is that Jesus Christ is the Logos, the Word of God incarnate, the Word made flesh, as St. John terms it. And the Bible, the scriptures are also the Logos, the Word of God written. And in this understanding, we see two parallel mysteries, both the incarnate Word of God and the written Word of God are uniquely divine and uniquely human at the same time. That's why the great doctor of the church, St. Jerome, in a quote often repeated by then Pope Benedict XVI, said this, quote, ignorance of the Bible is ignorance of Christ. Scripture is entirely trustworthy and authoritative as a guide for our faith and conduct because its real author is entirely trustworthy and authoritative. Listen to a few quotes by some of the ancient fathers of the church. First of all, St. Augustine, quote, The scriptures are holy, they are truthful, they are blameless. St. John Damascene, quote, To search the sacred scriptures is very good and most profitable for the soul, for like a tree which is planted near the running waters, so does the soul, watered by sacred scriptures, also grow hearty and bear fruit in due season. This is the true faith." End quote. St. John Chrysostom, quote, Without the exhortation of the scriptures, man cannot grow to maturity. End quote. So the reason why reading and studying the Bible is so vital is to allow God to speak to us through his word and to apply what he says to our lives. Again, to allow God to speak to us through his word and to apply what he says to our lives. It is, coupled with the church's sacred tradition, 
our primary source of knowledge about God and his plan of redemption. And so notice St. Paul's words about the power, the real spiritual power that is encapsulated in the scriptures. He says this in our epistle reading this morning, quote, it is able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work." End quote. No other writings on this planet can make and fulfill that claim. The scriptures as given to us by the church and as taught and interpreted by the church's tradition and magisterium are our primary source of doctrine. If you want to see what happens when a church drifts away from that understanding, just look around at the landscape of confused, watered-down denominations today and see how they have departed from biblical truth. G.K. Chesterton once wrote that if you do away with the truth of God, the danger is not that you will believe in nothing, but rather that you will believe in anything. Again, all you have to do is consider the prolif proliferation of nonsensical ideologies that are overtaking our popular culture to understand that what Chesterton said is true. If you do away with the truth of God, the danger is not that you will believe in nothing, but that you will believe in anything. Now, everything that I've said to you about the value and importance of the Bible presupposes and hinges on one thing. What is that one thing? That you read it. And not just read it like you would read any book, but read it in such a way that it becomes a part of you. How do we do that? We do that by reading reflectively, meditatively, and prayerfully, asking the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, both to open and enlighten our hearts and minds as we read. We do it by approaching our study of the scriptures with a teachable spirit and a humble attitude of obedience toward what it says to us. And we do it by reading the scriptures with the church. With the church. What do I mean by that? Reading with the church. Well, one way is to come to church on Sunday. This is just a suggestion, but come to church on Sunday or during the week having already read and absorbed the day's scripture readings for the Mass. Another way during your personal reading time is to read the Bible with your catechism by your side. Are you aware that there are 32 pages of scripture references in the back of the catechism? 32 pages of just chapter and verse, just the, re just the references. So as you're reading a specific Bible passage, there's a pretty good chance that you could find that passage cited and explained in the catechism. Or if there's not a specific reference for that passage, the catechism also has a very comprehensive topical index to help you out, reading and studying with the church. And so in conclusion, in the church, Jesus has given us two wonderful all-encompassing gifts to assist us in walking in friendship with him on our journey to heaven. Those two gifts are his word and the sacraments. Word and sacrament. Those two, by the way, are symbolically illustrated behind me on the, the two green banners that are hanging on the wall. The written word of God informed and interpreted and made complete by sacred tradition, and the seven sacraments vested within the apostolic authority of the church as our great dispensers of grace. Together, the word and the sacraments form us. They feed us, they strengthen us, they encourage us, they fill us with God's grace, 
and they both inspire and empower us to be transformed into the very image of God's own Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.